Okay, thank you very much. As we've heard in the last uh, hour and a half, there's been a lot of change in emergency surgery. And there's nothing that focuses the mind quite like the data that Sarah showed in her talk. Uh, and that's shown here, that uh, the number of general surgery jobs, which you can roughly reinterpret as emergency general surgery jobs in most cases, is now as high, this is adverts from the BMJ, SAC data, it's as high as colorectal and UGI. And that, to some degree, has caught everybody by surprise. And it's a reflection of our uh, lagging in keeping up to date with emergency surgery and all its challenges, and the ability now of chief execs, essentially, to, app to appoint who they want or who they feel the public need. And I guess the question is, should we be surprised about that? And I mean, you know now all these uh, serial figures about the impact of emergency surgery. So perhaps the big surprise is that we haven't been training people to lead this service. And sure, the changes we've heard about from Ian and Sarah are relatively recent, but uh, they've been on the stocks for a while. And now we have to begin to address the question of how we're going to train people to manage the changes. And there's no doubt that there uh, there's a modest cohort of young trainees who would like to do so. So let's think a wee bit about that. Before we lay into the trainers too much, of which I'm one, it's not that easy a problem. There's, it's a continually changing field on many fronts. Hours of training, we'll look at that as changed. It's now a consultant-led service. So rather than training uh, hard work one and two, one and three, as they did 20, 30 years ago, for five years before you reached the utopic consultant paradise, we're doing hands-on out of hours into middle and later life as consultants. So the service, rather than being a big bang training, it has to be sustainable and enjoyable. And we're only just beginning to think about that, because if we don't have that, young people won't come into it. Specialization we have to deal with, it's great for electives, but we're also training people now for very different hospitals. The notion of maybe 15 years ago that every hospital did the same thing is uh, going out of fashion again, and it ranges from very sub-specialized EGS, as they have in Edinburgh, let's say, with great success, right down to the rural hospital, which are clearly small beer in numbers, but for the two in the middle of which my hospital's one, either partly sub-specialized or the single consultant delivering EGS within a DGH, which will be an ongoing model, the training needs are clearly very different one from the other, and it's maybe daft to think they're the same. There's also different systems, there's hospitals, a substantial number have emergency surgeons and the impact to them, they've been fantastic agents for change. If you look at some of the things Sarah's highlighted, they all happen in hospitals with emergency surgeons by and large. But hospitals that have them are going to have different needs that those have don't. How are we going to train for that? And what are we aiming for? You know a lot about this, I'll skip over this quickly. We need a good admission service, a good gallbladder service, an expert laparotomy service, manageable workload, which often means more than one consultant. Nautica, I understand, have recently moved to having three consultants on in order to manage their sizable workload, which is a change from the past. You need someone to champion to get the resources. EGS surgeons are ideally placed to do that, but certainly committed local leadership and a modern structure. And the trainees hitherto have maybe been directed too much towards subspecialist practice, so we need them trained in the right skills, bred from depth, and interested in EGS. And one of the glaringly obvious things we have in our region is that the hospitals that have EGS services and strong leaders, Blackburn being the most obvious example, the trainees pour out of there all wanting to do EGS, and it's a wake-up call, certainly to many of the rest of us in the Northwest. The training problem, hours have gone down. Trainees were actually very good 20, 30 years ago, and they needed two or three times the number of hours and cases in order to become independent consultants. So it's maybe asking quite a lot of modern trainees, even though they're probably better than we were, to ask them to get to the same level in half or a third the time. Experience is shown here. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you needed 100 laparotomies roughly to become a senior reg. Only now it's that by CCT that we're not actually making that. Here's data from the, uh, the SAC survey of 2010-11. These are guys leaving the CCT program, and uh, these are all people uh, who are in good standing, not in Rita D's and E's, and you see the number of laparotomies, the average was 68, but the bottom quartile were only averaging 42 laparotomies by the time of CCT, 
and five Hartmans, which I'd suggest to you might fail the granny test. That was reflected or is reflected in consultant confidence and first appointment. Here's one of the surveys we did of trainees and consultant surgeons. This is of consultant surgeons. Those appointed 10 to 20 years ago, 80% of them felt ready to do independent EGS when they started in work. Those appointed 5 to 10 years ago, down to 70. Those appointed uh, between 2 and 5 years ago, 60% only. So 40% didn't feel ready for independent EGS. What made them anxious? Laparotomy and laparoscopy, usually in their non-specialist aspect of the GI tract. So we surveyed uh, trainees, Lindsay Pierce and Claire Hall did this, surveyed 276 trainees last year and asked them uh, how they would like to see training change. Uh, modular core training wasn't within that, but it's clear from David Jones' work in South Manchester that modular training offers the SHO a lot more to do than the conventional uh, routine attachment to colorectal surgery, for example, where you do uh, three days a week uh, or where you do three days a month on call. No one knows who you are and no one gives you anything to do. But the trainees want greater focus on emergencies in SPR training. They want defined blocks between ST3 and ST8. 70% want a six-month block of EGS. So there's a challenge and a half for all the TPDs, and most of them want fellowships as well in order to amplify the EGS training they've had through. What do consultants think of what trainees need? Well, we surveyed 270-odd consultants as well. Everybody who's an uh, ASGBI fellow was asked, and here's what they thought. More time, more operating, more focused training. And they thought that new consultants just like they did, maybe needed a bit more time dealing with emergencies, expanding their portfolio of case knowledge in order to fly independently uh, more happily. So should there be more experience as a new consultant? Probably. Should it be different for future consultants in smaller hospitals? Again, the survey was pretty strong in saying yes. Trainees are independently minded, which is good. After all, they're going to be looking after me when I'm old. And they have their own views on what sort of jobs they want, which again is excellent. And here's what they think. If you ask them, do they want to take a full-time EGS job, it's a minority who do. If you ask them, do they want to do subspecialist with general on-call or subspecialist and subspecialist on-call, then a much larger proportion want to do, because that's the way training directs them. Of course, what that doesn't answer is how they're going to get the competency to do subspecialist on-call, because there's increasing evidence they're maybe not quite fully cooked in the full spectrum of subspecialist practice by the time of CCT. The compromise position, do more initial EGS in early years of your consultancy job while you subspecialize and maybe learn pancreatectomy or hepatectomy or uh, low anterior resection independently or pouch surgery. About half the people are happy doing that. Same with an EGS career co coexisting with a subspecialist practice. So pure EGS is the least popular option, subspecialist uh, specialist surgery and specialist on call most popular, but as we've heard from the jobs doesn't match population needs. So where does that leave us? Many trainees have been undercooked at CCT, both in EGS and subspecialty. The MDT basis of major elective work doesn't apply to EGS if you're on your own. Less intense consultant roses now than we had previously, so you gain experience less quickly in early years as a consultant. There's jobs in EGS. Some trainees want to do EGS, but there's no training program. More trainees want to do subspecialty. Longer consultant career, so it needs to evolve with age. Repeated sources tell us that, and it makes sense. Different sized hospitals need different systems and needs, so how do we train for one thing, unless we modify it at the end? And the service needs to be manageable and sustainable. So how can we tie all that together? in five minutes. Well, I'm pleased to say that the ACP, OGIS and ASGBI have got together to tackle this problem and thanks very much to Ian Beckham and Asha Senapati, the two presidents who with their own working groups work very closely to churn out this document which as I'll show you is now available on the website uh, and will also be on the ACP and OGIS website shortly. First part of it goes through the components of the service that we've talked about in the course of today I won't deal with that further here, but we can answer questions on it later. But in the terms of service and training, here's what it says. And this is on the website now, so you can get a copy off the ASGBI website. 
We anticipate that in the future there will be both EGS surgeons, emergency general surgeons, and general surgeons with other specialist interests, for example, colorectal or upper GI, who will together deliver the EG service. That pattern will vary from hospital to hospital. From surveys now, we know some uh, EG surgeons, the odd one single-handed, more are in twos or threes, some are in sixes, and I think there's even an eight now. All job plans should, for all surgeons should show a direct commitment to EGS, uh, free of all elective activity except in the smallest hospitals, both while on duty and following night duty. All general surgeons should remain involved with emergency work throughout their careers, although the tasks, timings and intensity should vary. Having people over 55, for example, doing unselected night covers daft, there's no reason why they couldn't do more of the Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings once the kids are out of the way. That would be a sensible evolution. Few future trainees presently express an interest in becoming a surgeon with a special interest in EGS, but those who do, I think, will be extremely popular and have glittering careers. They should be encouraged and supported with training pathways which cross the current specialist boundaries. The development of job plans for all consultants with a special interest in EGS should be individualized to accommodate elective work, much as you heard from Sarah there. That will facilitate skill retention and development and give them an appropriate parallel elective practice where they desire, which most of them do from our surveys. Consultant surgeons recently appointed are less experienced and less confident of their abilities in EGS than their predecessors. Surgical training should focus more on that with longer daytime attachments and the developments of fellowships in EGS. And I'll show you at the end how that might work. Combining the desire of most people to offer subspecialist practice, so combining high quality emergency surgery with the desire to promote or to continue expert elective subspecialist surgery will likely be met by new upper GI and colorectal consultants undertaking a modestly increased share of daytime emergency surgery while they further develop more complex specialist skills such as I outlined. And there should be senior support a mentoring in order to harness senior experience and youthful enthusiasm and in that extent paired EGS duty. We have a paired upper lower GI on call service or emergency duty service and the same thing could work with older and younger. So how might training and development look? Well, if you want to be an emergency surgeon, you have to train an upper GI or lower GI at the moment. And there's some sense in that. It makes you fully trained in that specialty and such you can stand your ground with your peers in either of those two areas. Doing a fellowship, most colorectal and almost all upper GI surgeons who are going to be resectionists do a fellowship now. And there's no reason why the same couldn't apply to EGS. The big debate, though, is should that be done as an existing fellowship or should we go back to looking to early consultant appointment, proleptic appointments, for example, with an evolution of what the uh, early years consultant, if I can call them that, does during the first perhaps five years of their training. That probably happens anyway, and we're one of the only uh, European countries that hasn't got a defined gradation of consultant level. Two possible examples of many that I could lay out to you. Somebody wanting to do EGS, let's say they'd already done their CCT in colorectal, so they might do a one or two year fellowship in upper GI, along with more EGS experience. That might include trauma, as we'll talk about this afternoon. It would be sensible, as we've heard from Ian, to, uh, for that fellowship to have a, have a very strong biliary profile and it might have junior and senior phases. To begin with, you might be working alongside a consultant EGS. Maybe in your second year, you'd be flying a lot more solo while the, you know, while the EGS consultant is off doing something, something else, but who's on the end of the phone as a point of reference. A new colorectal specialist, for example, may do EGS daytime one week in six, which might be more frequent than the older consultants, but at the same time they'd be developing their own colorectal practice along with their EGS skills and they'd be undergoing mentored development in advanced colorectal surgery, uh, complex laparoscopic, uh, IBD surgery, pouch surgery, etc., etc. You get the idea. The thing we've not touched on there is how we shape this and what we're doing it for. Emergency surgery has changed enormously. It used to be a thing that only the trainees did. 
and now it's a thing, there have been almost more changes in consultant practice over the last 10 years than there have been in what the trainees have to go through. And we need to refocus to do that. So Zachary Cope was a famous London surgeon, famous for his uh, various writings, one of which was the early diagnosis of the acute abdomen. He also wrote the early diagnosis of the acute abdomen in rhyme, and that just gives us a pointer. They called me to an urgent case to which I went with laggard pace. The unpopularity of EGS has been there for a long time, and maybe it was easier when you only had to do it for four or five years as a trainee. Now you have to do it for all your whole consultant years. We need to think again, and we need to reorganize how things work. So we want to get it to which I went with happy face. That would be a big step forward. In summary then, should EGS training change? Yes, it should. Should we have modular core training? Absolutely. Should we have a greater focus on emergencies in specialist registrar training? Yes. Six-month blocks is the challenge to any TPDs in the room. Fellowships in EGS, yes. More experience as a new consultant, yes. Different in smaller hospitals, yes. Should we train EG surgeons? Yes, I believe we should. Thanks very much.